public safety community. Welcome to the next episode of PSN at Home. We are here with our honored guest, John Tibbet, who is the uh, director of program services. Uh, fire service programs. Director of fire service programs for the NFFF and uh, has got about a 44 year career in the fire service, uh, much of which was up in Montgomery County, Maryland. I know you're down in South Carolina for some period of time. Uh, at-large board member for at, at uh, IAFC, uh, and uh, just a, totally accomplished in uh, in the area of uh, firefighter safety. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, 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 near miss and 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 um, uh, uh, CRM and anything else that uh, that is going to tickle our fancy here uh, and uh, share with our our audience. So welcome, um, uh, very uh, great to have you on the show today. Thank you. It's a, it's a real honor to, to, to join you. And um, we had our first little uh, episode of CRM right here when, uh, when you were kind of looking for the terminology there. And uh, you, you jumped right on it when I, when I, I, I dropped the word in. Exactly. Uh, it's teamwork, exactly. teamwork, yeah, teamwork. It's exactly. It. That's exactly how it's supposed to work. And of course, we can't forget introducing uh, the one, the only, the infamous T.J. Kennedy here, my friend and colleague, also uh, a former fighter fighter himself. So welcome, T.J. Thank you, Jason. Glad to be here with you and John, and it's going to be a great discussion. I think uh, career resource management is something that should be utilized everywhere, and if it's not, uh, we can talk more about it today and why it should be, and I think that's an important discussion. Absolutely. So great. So I know, you know, you, you are one of the pioneers in career resource management, kind of brought that to the table. Can you kind of give us a sense of, you know, just generally how it works, how, you know, you've, you've seen it implemented, and then we can talk a little bit more about, you know, some of the current applications and where we see, you know, it really being useful and going forward. Okay, sure. The, uh, the impetus for uh, CRM and the fire service was, was actually in 1999. Um, Gary Breeze was the executive director of the IAFC at the time. He had seen a presentation uh, in another venue about CRM and brought it back to the IAFC and uh, thought that it was something that, that, that may have some application. So uh, he convened a, uh, a group or called a meeting together, got some funding from uh, Dennis Smith, the author of Report from Engine Company 82. Uh, the federal government provided a little bit of funding, pulled this meeting together of uh, people with uh, experience in CRM from the aviation industry, uh, the military, and then also some, some moving and sh movers and shakers in the fire service like Alan Brunacini, Dennis Rubin, uh, and a host of others. So uh, out of that meeting, uh, there, there was, um, I happened to be working part-time for the IFC at the time and um, was assigned the project. So it was uh, my good fortune to be the person that, that got, um, got all the folks together to, to pull the meeting together. So that collective group, uh, after trading information, decided that crew resource management was applicable to the fire service and uh, sort of launched into um, a plan of where the, where the fire service should go with it. So the work continued on, um, additional funding was obtained, um, a point, uh, well, 9-11 occurred, and that certainly changed everyone's outlook on, on where they were going with the world. Uh, but CRM was seen as something we could implement um, for, a, for a low dollar value, since it's so much of a human interaction um, endeavor. So we moved along that ground, um, developed training programs, uh, had a very uh, good fortune to attend the U.S. Airways CRM training in Pittsburgh uh, with, with airline pilots and mechanics and uh, flight attendants. And I would say that was probably a very pivotal experience in my career uh, because of the way they presented it and just made me more and more of a disciple of, of the program. Yeah, you make a great point on the aviation piece and how this comes together. And what was interesting for me, I was a flight paramedic for Life Flight in Salt Lake City many years ago while I was a firefighter in Park City. And um, I first experienced crew resource management as part of being a, a flight crew uh, on the public safety side from the air medical side. And it, it, it truly does make a huge difference. And it's truly showing how that communication, that situational awareness, the appropriate decision making, and most importantly, that anybody on the crew should speak up and that anybody should feel comfortable about speaking about safety issues, speaking about um, issues in what we're doing, whether it's navigation, whether it's, it's safety related, but, but, but knowing that everybody's voice matters and that 
to the point you know you were alluding to a minute ago too that everybody everybody how they leverage that and their their voice being part of it is part of the solution because one person saying hey i'm not comfortable with this there might be three other people not comfortable with it either but they weren't speaking up and and i got to experience that personally flying and and i i, I just saw how how critical that was can you give us some examples in the fire service where where this has really made a difference and maybe just talk about an example or two that stands out most in your mind sure um well, I don't, I don't think we can move forward without acknowledging the work of Dr. Robert Helmreich. Uh, he truly was the, the, the father of it. He's, he's the individual who studied air crash events through the cockpit voice recording and determined the very points you're making, TJ, about people speaking up or not speaking up. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my own experience, uh, I think probably the one that comes to mind more than ever is, is in the response uh, when, and the apparatus response. When, when people are, are you know, assembled on a fire truck and they go on a call, ha, you know, just having that officer or driver say, is it clear? Mm -hmm. And the driver says yes, or the officer says yes, or something of that nature it, it is really at the, at the very granular level how CRM is actually working, where communication is taking place, somebody's asked to observe something and get feedback. Mm -hmm. um, my, from my own experience, I could, you know, I, I could uh, remember working as an officer and calling back to somebody in the back of the truck that was more familiar with the area. I'm, I'm, I was on overtime. And I would say, are you, you know, does, it, does anybody know anything about this building as we're, as we're going to the call? Because I was, I was you know, working in a different battalion on a different shift, different day. And somebody would say, yes, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's commercial occupancy or the connections on the Bravo side or something of that nature. So I, uh, you know, I think that's the positive. On the, on the negative side, there have been times when I didn't ask for help, and I should have, where people were afraid to speak up because they thought, well, as the officer, I had all the answers. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I, I would say that, that crew resource management, once you're exposed to it and once you implement it, is truly revolutionary in performance. It, make, it makes better officers, for one thing. It, it, you know, it should not be seen as, as a way to undermine authority. Yeah, you, you, you raise an excellent point about that. And, 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 you know, this transcends just the fire service, right? It's the concept that the senior person on scene has all the answers or makes the decisions. And there's the chain of command, you know, that, that everybody's working under. But this, this kind of turns that on its head a little bit, but in a constructive and a positive way. So when, you're, when this is being introduced, I mean, what's kind of training, you know, is it a cultural um, um, aspect of, of each department is there kind of formalized training so that, you know, that person who is new on the job or, you know, is in the lower part of the chain of command, you know, they are comfortable speaking up or asking the question, or if you're in a senior you know, position, making sure that they're asking the question so they have the necessary situational awareness. I mean, how has that worked? And has, has, has there been um, any resistance to that in, in, as you've seen throughout your career? Yes, and I think the most successful implementation um, comes from the Coast Guard. They had they they not only implemented it, but they did an awful lot of research while they were putting it in practice. So uh, my my interaction with Coast Guard comes from the time I spent in Charleston, as well as working with Coast Guard members during the course of developing CRM for the fire service, and and they um, you know their approach was that every level received the training. This was, this was going to revolutionize, and you talked about culture, it, it's, it's about behaviors and beliefs in how your organization is structured. So it, it, um, it can't be something that's only introduced at the recruit level, and then you hope it bubbles up as, the, as those folks move up the ranks. Everybody has to be introduced to it at the same time, but introduced to it in a manner that fits their level in the organization. So for instance, when you're doing, um, you know, the recruit training is you're encouraged to speak up, you're encouraged to be respectful, um, make sure you don't let anything go by, don't, don't assume that the officer is seeing what you saw. And from the supervisor perspective, uh, the training has to revolve around, make sure your ears are open and you are welcoming input and you create an environment where people are not afraid to speak up. And then reinforcing the fact that this will make you a more effective supervisor, a more respected leader. All of those elements tied in together sort of break the back of, well, you know, I worked hard to get my rank. And now you're telling me the lowest person on the totem pole is, is or the lowest person on the, on the scale is going to give me 
um, advice on, on what to do. Um, and then the lowest, the, the lower people are, are not encouraged to speak up or afraid to speak up. What about the near miss system? Uh, there's some key elements that have uh, come around with lessons learned, and I think it's important for us to, uh, to, to be open and communicate when we don't always get things right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, they were, the CRM and near miss were envisioned as, as, as partners, and, and they truly work hand in hand. So uh, Linda Connell was influential in telling us how the aviation safety reporting system worked, uh, making sure you create an environment that's non-punitive and, and respects people's privacy. So from her, uh, from her recommendations, along with that cadre of people that we talked about at the beginning, the Nearmus reporting system for firefighter, firefighters was created uh, modeling that, that type of system. And if you go to the near-miss reporting system, which is still up and running now, you can search reports and you can search them by crew resource management, or you can search them by the elements of crew resource management, like look for reports of the old communication. And each of those reports will have a lesson in it that the writer uh, wants to convey, whether it was, this is, this is how communication should work. Uh, this is where I took advice uh, and it made a difference, or this is where I didn't take advice and the outcome, it wasn't the way we expected it. So the near miss reporting system is, is really a hand in glove partner with crew resource management training. But one of the keys on that, right, you said it, is, is there's a non-punitive nature in all of this, right? I mean, and there has to be a, a, a culture of, of transparency and the willingness to, to disclose some of this information so that right. it can be addressed, you know, in an objective manner, right? Oh, absolutely. And I, th I think one of the elements that makes the, the biggest difference in there is also in the training, people do have to understand because one of the, one of the misconceptions is that you can use a near miss report to get out of trouble. Mm -hmm. So uh, explaining to people what occurs in, in the error chain and is that an error of omission because you forgot a rule or you didn't know about the rule? Or did you say, I know what the rule is and I'm just not gonna do that. So that you know, takes you down a, a disciplinary path if you, if you break the rule on purpose. Um, but there are, you know, there are more and more, more, there's more and more research and data coming out that about 80% of things that go wrong are based on people genuinely making a mistake about what that was, was going on. They, they didn't perceive the situation correctly. They misread signs. Uh, they overlooked things co completely um, in, a, in, a, in a fashion that wasn't, I'm just thumbing my nose at authority. So ma making sure people understand that, that, they, that they, they won't get in trouble if they can demonstrate that they just didn't get it as opposed to, I'm, I'm not doing this because I, I don't want to do it. You know, and I actually, T TJ, you know, I, you've got an experience where, and I'm interested, John, in you're your, your thinking this and, and, and how this has been implemented, but is it always a situation where it's, it's voluntary in that this is all, I can speak up I, if, if I choose to do that, um, and the listener can choose to take that advice how they deem appropriate, or are there situations where it's really mandatory and TJ, you know, what I'm referring to you is, is, you know, if someone just feels uncomfortable and says, you know what, I'm calling this, I'm not comfortable. We're not going to go down that route. And I have the veto authority simply because I'm not comfortable under this policy. How, how has that worked and, and, and kind of rolled out? And TJ, I know you have some of that experience, you know, in, in, in your days as a flight paramedic. Yeah, I want John to go first and then I'll jump in with my personal experience. Well, uh, I think that is that is one of the um, that one of the significant challenges of just how much of your input uh, ha has has in the outcome. So, you know, when I went back, when we were talking about how you implement a program in, a, in an organization, you talk about there's a there's a way the training is delivered to the new people, and there's a way the training is delivered to the incumbents. So, the, the incumbent or the the leader of the group will have the final say. So that, that in and of itself can create its own friction. And, and this isn't something you implement on Monday and by Friday, everybody's drank, drank the Kool-Aid and they're, they're on their way. Uh, there's, gonna be, there's gonna be friction, there's gonna be ups and downs. But I think the overarching element there is 
understanding that the as the input comes in, the person with the final say has, I've heard what you said, I, I appreciate your input, uh, my experience, knowledge, whatever, is not evaluating this the same way yours is, but I get it, and we're still going to go this way. So then it boils down to, as long as it's not immoral, unethical, or illegal, then the supervisor has the final say. Makes the call. Makes the call. Has to be. TJ? Well, yeah, and, and it's very similar to the way we experienced it. And, and on a flight crew, you know, at the end of the day, we had a single pilot uh, flight crew. So we had a single pilot in command. And, and at the end of the day, they're the captain of the flight and they're in command. But to, to John's point, they, they need to acknowledge the information. They need to discuss it. You know, you have a flight crew for a reason and, and you discuss that. But, but you also need to take that into consideration. At the end of the day, he's responsible or she's responsible for landing that aircraft safely. And they need to perform that role. But I will say I, I personally was a part of times where, where safety was discussed and, and flights were turned around and, and having that kind of a discussion like, hey, these clouds are getting pretty low. What do you think about that? Um, can precipitate an amazing, you know, different chain of events that you will never know whether that prevented uh, a crash or prevented an incident or prevented you getting into worse weather or something else. Because that discussion, the magic is that discussion between, let's say, a flight paramedic and a pilot that says, you're right, these clouds are getting lower. Are, are you uncomfortable? Well, yeah. Okay, great. Well, we're going to turn around. We're going to go do something else. It's, it's, it's their choice, but it's that, that fact that you're having that discussion about what, what you're seeing, what your eyes are seeing, what you're feeling, what's a part of that particular response. And it's an emergency response to somebody in the need of help. But it's also, this is when we have to be more careful because often in, in the fire service and EMS and so forth, we get tied around, we're going to a car crash with a couple of critical victims. At the same point, you need to fly there safely or drive there safely and get back safely. And that has to be part of that journey. And so it's really important to understand that, you know, not, not getting there or not getting back safely is not a good outcome. You got to speak up. Absolutely. So a, a couple more questions and, and you, know, both, you know, and really, you know, this is one I'm, I'm, I'm still in TJ's thunder a little bit, but I'll have him have him jump in on this as well, because he's he's he, he's got experience in this area as well. So it's almost like I've got two two fabulous experts here to, to interview. Um, what about technology? So how has technology either been used and implemented in crew resource management and or how do you see it? being implemented and used now with all of kind of the new tools regarding situational awareness and communication, um, you know, going forward. So John, why don't you start? Uh, well, thanks. Um, I think the, the technology aspect is very much um, a double-edged sword. And, and Dr. Helmreich talked about that. He talked about the beauty of the cockpit voice recorder being the key that unlocked what was happening in the cockpit. Um, and, and led to the development of crew resource management because of what they heard between the interaction of crew. The, the downside of technology is we have, as a, even in, as a fire service, thought that every time a firefighter was killed in a line of duty, we could, we could work our way out of the next line of duty death by putting in another bell, another whistle, another gizmo to make it work. And our, our path was almost the same as aviation. Um, it, it wasn't until they realized that it was the human interaction mm -hmm. that would be the ultimate saving grace. Technology is essential. Um, the MDT screens, uh, the, you know, the, the, the computerized apparatus, uh, all those elements there, the, the rollover protection in vehicles, all of that stuff is critical uh, and essential. It, 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 it's gotta be a partnership, but we can't lose fact uh, or can't lose sight of the fact that, that the human mind can only accomplish and absorb so much at, at certain points in time. And we need to have the extra eyes, the extra ears, the extra mouths uh, that are there providing input. Yeah, I agree with John. I, I really think crew resource management is about the humans. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's about humans speaking up and the interaction and the good conversations between uh, firefighters, EMS personnel, others that are, are communicating what they see and how they operate and what, what kind of safety risks and other things that occur. I do think much like the black box and aircraft um, that for fire and EMS and, and law enforcement for that matter, uh, it could be the body worn camera with video and audio or the dash camera with video and audio that plays a similar purpose. 
and it allows us to go back after uh, a call or after an incident and, and review with a lessons learned mindset of what could we do better? What, what happened during that incident? What could have been done better? Could the communication have been better? Could the decision making have been better? Was there enough teamwork where people speaking up and helping each other? Uh, you know, the, these are, you know, were there barriers to having that happen? I, I think those are huge. And I think it's not just for fire and EMS. I also think it's for law enforcement. And I think that we've seen this in aviation, we've seen this in, in fire and EMS. I don't think we've seen it as much in law enforcement. And I think that, you know, the same kinds of concept could be utilized across all of public safety, um, more so than it maybe has been in the past. And I think maybe it's a good time in our country and around the world to look at, you know, should we take another look at crew resource management? How do we break the chain of some bad events and, and prevent them from occurring? And uh, I just always think of CRM being, you know, a big part of breaking that chain of, of bad decisions or bad events that, that lead to a catastrophic event. Yeah, I mean, you, you hit it on the head. And with everything going on, you know, in the world today, you know, we'd be remiss not to, you know, mention there, obviously what happened in Minnesota and everything going on now with the police protests. It, it seems like there's some version of crew resource management that certainly could be expanded to other areas, not just, to, you know, certainly not just in public safety, but it is certainly within public safety. If you have the right um, rules, the right parameters, the right culture to, to, um, implement it in a way that's going to be constructive and useful. And, and to your point, not, not as a punitive big brother type of function, but really to improve the type of overall service that the particular agency or individuals are providing, you know, event after event, right? Yeah. The technology. Yeah, no, go ahead. No, I, I think you're right. The, the, uh, one of the, one of the uh, adjectives that goes to crew resource manage, management or descriptors is force multiplier. And you know, I, I don't know of an organization or industry that um, did not implement crew resource management and fail. So um, I, I know that the, the railroad industry has done it. Medical, the medical field has certainly implemented it. Uh, flight crews, uh, fire departments, um, EMS teams. So it's, it, it, it's conducive for any time two human beings are interacting, then crew resource management has value. No, I agree. And I think we just need to be smart about it and we have to leverage it. And I think for, for public safety, it's, it's also, it's about culture. And, and I think that, you know, it's about the communication and the culture of how agencies operate and, and having that openness and transparency, even with each other is so critical. And so I, I just think it's, it's a lesson we can all take away right now that could be applied in probably greater ways as we look at how to embed the kind of cultures we want to see across public safety organizations and how, how it will work with the, the, the citizens in their communities. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, anywhere we have human interaction, I think this kind of, you know, constructive, uh, discussion and and uh, interactions are, are are only going to improve the situation. They're going to make folks more productive. They're going to make folks safer. And to your both your points, you know, and when utilizing technology, especially today, you know, there's technology like AI, which effectively is a replacement for decision making in certain cases, which you know is likely not the right thing here, right? The human interaction is is so important, and and the human fallibility of it all is 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 really what we're trying to address. Um, but using the right technology as a tool in your hand so that you can communicate to TJ's point, if you have video, if you have, you know, broadband where you can communicate and you're making sure, you know, I've got situational awareness because, you know, I, I've got, I've got a firefighter over here showing me, you know, something and I have experience and I can see it and I can communicate, you know, Hey, you need to think about this. You know, so where technology is used as a tool, of the individuals seems like it could be really helpful, but not as a replacement for that decision making and for that interaction, which I think is so critical. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't agree more. In the time that I spent in Charleston, uh, part of the rebuilding of the department, we, we created um, an updated command team system uh, for them to use. And one of the responsibilities of later arriving commanders was to take a lap, another lap around the building and since everybody had a phone, snap a couple of photos of what the other sides of the building looked like. So when you got back to the command post, you could show those to the incident commander and say, this is what I just saw a few seconds ago. So there's, I mean, there's an innocent technology. And even some of the BCs were um, good enough that they could just put their phone on video. So they did their 360 with a video. When you got back to the command post, you shared it. So even though it was something so simple and something that you know, people didn't really give a whole lot of thought to, 
uh, you know, instead of just taking pictures of your, your dog or your, your favorite dinner, we were actually taking that technology that everybody had in their hand and converting it to something that we were able to bring more information into the command post to, and function at a higher level. It's a great example of a low cost solution to solve a very dangerous problem and give better situational awareness. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, with that, uh, you know, fantastic discussion. I think, you know, super, super useful information, John. Uh, really appreciate you coming on, spending the time talking about crew resource management and, and near miss system and technology and, and how important it is, you know, uh, for us to all continue to think about how we can support one another in these disciplines and expand them, you know, to new applications. I mean, it really is something that just at the end of the day is going to make us all effect, uh, more effective uh, and make everybody safer. And, and if they do it in, a, in an objective way, and to CJ's point, really ingrained it in the culture. Um, so I want to thank you very much for uh, joining us today. Uh, super insightful. Uh, we will see everybody uh, next week on our next episode of PSN at Home. And for now, everyone stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Take John. Care. Appreciate it.